So I, did a, I do a lot of work on the uh, south side of Chicago um, with students from low income, which is a little different from the context I think of many of you are working with, but I think it still has a lot of uh, lessons that can be learned. Um, so let me start by telling you um, a little about my background and why I'm actually doing this work. So I'm from Kansas. I grew up in um, Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and I knew in growing up there that I wanted to get out of Kansas. Um, and at that point, when I grew up, there were two ways. There were sports and there were academics. Um, I was tall as a kid. I haven't grown since the fourth grade. My father was 6'3", my girl cousins are six feet, so I thought basketball was gonna be my way out. So I spent a lot of time and energy focusing on basketball, but also focused academically too. And there was an intersection in the eighth grade where the basketball teacher happened to be the computer science instructor, and I felt that if I took his class, that would help make me, you know, become the starting point guard. So I took a programming class with no interest in it whatsoever. And from that day in the eighth grade, developed an interest and a love in technology that has seen me through college, um, Stanford getting a degree in computer science, then into grad school getting a degree in learning sciences that combine computer science education and technology, and edu computer science education and psychology. But at the core for me has always been trying to understand what is it or what was it about the learning experiences that I experienced growing up in Kansas um, that enabled me to, to find an interest in technology back in 1980 you know, when it really wasn't you know, that cool to do it. So um, most of my research has been trying to figure out how to create similar types of learning environments such that other kids, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic status, have the ability to develop the skill sets that they need. So that's the context of what I'm gonna talk about for uh, today with some examples of how we can make that, um, how we can make that happen. I need to first start by um, acknowledging, let's see, we go there. Um, okay, we're on the right. Uh, acknowledging that I'm the fortunate one who oftentimes gets to stand up and talk, but there's a team of many who have been doing this work. So we've been doing this work first funded by the MacArthur Foundation and the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and in partnership with colleagues out of Stanford University, University of Chicago. And my actual team back in Chicago is a team of tool designers, technology designers, digital mentors who you'll hear about, learning scientists, teachers and curriculum developers at all the schools, the families, the kids. Um, it's really a slew of, of, of probably 30 to 40 people who do all this work that enables me to get up and actually talk about it. Um, but I want to start with this assumption, and, and let me back up by saying the conversation, the presentation last night, I think was hopefully what I'm going to talk about dovetails in. What Dr. Rosen talked about last night really helped us to understand, well, who, how is all of this technology sort of changing how students are conceptualizing and, and taking in information? Um, but what I hope to talk about today is how do we create these environments that enable them to be um, create with it. So I want to start with the question that if we believe that a society's definition of what it means to be literate is tied to the technological innovations of its time, then given in the lifetime of um, a college, probably sophomore, junior today, all of these things have been created. I and mean, remember when I was in, um, I'm now over 40, so I can no longer consider myself young, but when I was young, um, the innovation of my time was Atari. So everyone had, you know, an Atari. But an Atari didn't change fundamentally how you communicated with anyone. You know, I played, you know, the Pong with my brother, but it didn't change how I communicate with my grandmother. In today's time, my two-year-old nephew um, Facebooks, I mean, face, um, uh, FaceTimes my uh, mother who lives in Chicago and he lives in Houston and they have a, and she reads a book to him. So the very nature definition of uh, communication has changed in today's lifetime. And what that also means is by even the ways in which we take in news, it's not just text, um, it's in podcasts, blogs, videos, graphics, and what really was brought home, this was brought home to me, um, the last Olympics, so being, Traditionally, in how America covers the Olympics, is you have Bob Costas, who you know you watch the Olympics, and at night he gives you the run, you know, the recap of everything that's happened. But now, with you know Facebook and Twitter and everything else, by the time he comes on, you know, online at seven o'clock p.m., you already know all the events. So it was a really interesting experience this year watching 
you know, NBC trying to do the traditional approach to how they cover the Olympics when all the information that everyone had was already out and about. And that's just an example of the ways in which we take in information are so varied nowadays that we really have to stop and think, well, what does it mean to be literate? Is it just about one's ability to read or is it also about one's ability to write? And so our work has started with the assumption that it's not just about reading and it's not just about writing traditionally, writing text or just um, being literate computationally. In order for a kid to be literate today, they're going to have to be musically literate, graphically literate, cinematically and interactively. They're going to have to be able to communicate in multiple modes of in multiple ways. They can't just have one medium that they understand how to produce in and how to, how to uh, consume in. And so if that's, the, if that's the reality, then we have to look at ourselves as teachers and as communities and say, well, how are we going to teach this, right? And in America, we know, I think we have the most people, I think in any place, there's the assumption that all kids are digital natives, right? That all kids are sort of born understanding how to produce and consume with media. But that's not true. Most, all kids are probably born today being able to consume media, but they're not necessarily born being able to produce it. And so we have closed the digital divide, and so in the, with E-Rate and all kinds of different things, we now have the ability to say almost any kid has access to some device, uh, be it their phone, a computer, in their house, even their Xbox, PlayStation, whatever, that can get them on the internet, where they consume technology and consume media. But the data is, uh, is showing us that very few kids can actually create. And so what we now have is a participation gap, where there's a big gap between those who can create versus those who can just consume. And what we mean by participation gap is really defined as the unequal access to opportunities, experiences, skills, and knowledge that will hopefully prepare you to participate in the world tomorrow. And so why this is important is you just think of um, YouTube, or you just think of how you've taken the news. Yes, if you click on a video on YouTube, there's maybe three, four, 50 million people who've watched a video. Everyone's consuming it. But if you don't have the ability to produce, then you're never in a position of actually creating the story, right? So you're always just taking in someone else's opinion. In many, in some universities today in, in America, they're actually now requiring students to be able to do a, a video, post a video of themselves, not just write an essay, but actually create a video uh, introducing themselves. And you'll be surprised how many students don't understand the basics of editing, so they can't actually even create and edit a video that represents themselves. So this type of literacy is becoming an essential literacy um, for all people, um, all people to have. And so I want to give you, um, so this is our reality. We have a participation gap, and I would say that participation gap is not just in America, it's probably, it's probably all over. But how do, we be, how do we go about taking care of uh, addressing it? So I'm going to show you two snapshots of two kids, two very different kids, um, and their reality with technology. The first is a snapshot of a 12-year-old kid. Uh, hopefully you can um, sort of make this out, but it's not, I'll explain it. Um, this is a 12-year-old, and he was asked um, with his, um, I think with his aunt, um, to sit down and sort of map out how he uses technology and what he does on a daily, on a daily basis across home, school, after school, and then back home. So if you think about it, he wakes up in the morning, he goes to school for most of the day, he's in after school, and then he's back at home. And there's two categories. There's local community, so things he does where he's physically present, and then things he does where it's online based. And you see the different circles. Um, so in the morning, he's on uh, YouTube, then he does some guitar lessons. Um, in the morning, right before school day starts, he has his band practice. He's, he was, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a site for him. He, at school, he might look at Wikipedia. Um, then at home, he's, he's really into fan fiction, so he goes to the Harry Potter, and he's doing a lot of writing and consuming of Harry Potter. So if you look at these are a whole bunch of different activities where this kid, he's on, he, this is also, he was on MySpace. I'm sure that would be, would be replaced with Facebook now. Um, you see all these different experiences that the kid has. Now, the important thing is you see the arrow, I mean the arrow that combines, combines YouTube, guitar lessons, and band practice. Those are the only experiences that he saw as connected, right? So he used YouTube to learn, to, to get videos for, uh, to teach him how to, um, for guitar lessons, 
right? And then when he went into band practice, he felt that those videos helped make him a better uh, guitar, guitar player. But those are the only experiences that connected. Everything else for him is disjointed. So what he might be, so his writing that he's doing in, her, in the fan fiction sites for Harry Potter is disconnected from any writing or anything he's actually doing in the school day. So his teacher doesn't know that he's written pages and pages of text, knows nothing about it, and he doesn't even see how to connect them. So here's a kid who has a lot of experiences, but they're disconnected. Now let me show you another kid. This is a kid, Maurice, and this is a representation that we use called technobiography that you'll see again. Um, we sat down with his parents, his mother, father, and him, and did an interview around when and where he used technology from you know, birth to the end of the fifth grade. And what you see, if you, you, know, you see only four boxes on this chart. And so this kid, by the age of fifth grade, had only you know, used like a Reader Rabbit program and had done one technology-related thing in, um, in, in school. So these kids are the same age. And think about the difference between how much interaction and development with technology this kid has had versus this kid right here. And so the question when we talked to the parents of Maurice, we said, well, OK, well, you know, what role do you think technology should play in your kids' learning? And their parent and his parents said, well, we think that's the responsibility of the school. So we send them to school, and the school needs to be the place where he's developing all his technical literacy. And so the question that we, we, we want to begin with is, how do we begin to think about changing the definition of where kids are developing their digital literacies such that the school is not the only place where kids are learning how to be literate, but it's a, it's a node in the system? You know, one of the things working with a lot of teachers we get is as more and more people say we need to bring technology into the school, they go like, you're adding more and more responsibility on me. How can we begin to think about how you can help teachers think about integrating technology into their instruction, but not having to necessarily be the person who has to teach the kid how to do everything they need to do. So our work that we're about to talk about is how do you, how do you actually create a system such that the school can take advantage of all the technology skills that the kid is learning, and how do you help bring in experts and, and people into the school who, that can make this happen? And what this might look like, and here's just a map, something that we uh, drew up, is that imagine this is a community and a kid has all these interests. A kid might be doing video production in the library, they might be doing blogging at school, poetry in the library, at home they might be learning how to do some other things in robotics at a museum, but all these experiences are taking place. But somehow we have the way to connect them one to the other so that the school understands what the kid is learning and how to take advantage of it. So I'll show you an example of that. But to begin, I wanna, one of the things we notice, and I wanna, I wanna make sure I point this out here, is that when we talk to kids and we talk to them about what motivated them to develop their literacies, one of the things they talk about is why they spend so much time out of school developing their digital literacies is this notion of audience. They have an audience. There's someone to look at their work. And that for many kids, the school, the traditional audience of teacher is not a relevant audience for them to put in the effort necessary. So I'm not necessarily talking about, I mean, some kids come from families where there's an understanding that you need to do well in school because school is a path that gets you to the next point. For many kids, and particularly the kids we work with in Chicago, that's not the assumption. Um, maybe no one in their family has gone to college and many people haven't graduated from high school. So just doing well in school, getting the assignment done because you need to get assignment done is not motivation enough. But what we found is that when you create audience for um, the kids, when the audience becomes the, um, the school, the community, or the global audience, that becomes a motivator for kids to put in the work in iterating on their work. Even here, um, like we were told last night that the, um, all the students doing the recording of the place are the kids in the audio audiovisual audio club. This becomes, there's an audience for their work that sort of motivates them to say, okay, I need to make sure that my camera work is a little better. I need to make sure that I'm actually, you know, figuring out how to do the recording because they're not just doing it for a class assignment, they're doing it for a purpose. And so the analogy, so when we, when we look around, how do we, are there examples that already exist that can help us understand how to transform schools as these types of learning spaces where kids are naturally, um, naturally motivated to put in the work and effort to develop their skill set because they have an audience. 
one place to look, and I'm sorry, I'm from Chicago, home of, of Michael, uh, Michael Jordan, and as I said earlier, I love basketball. My analogy is going to be basketball, but it could be a soccer field, a tennis, a tennis court. Um, all you have to do um, is look at play spaces to see an analogy for how this works. If you think of most courts where you play, a couple of things happen. On that court at any one point in time, people can be spectating, watching, people can be practicing, people can be performing, and people can level up. So just watching any, any court. I mean, people, anybody watching the Australian Open? Anybody seeing what's happening with the Australian Open? Okay. So in the, in the it was uh, when, Vina, uh, when Serena just lost to the young, the young lady from um, uh, America. What's interesting is in the interview of the young lady, she talked about Serena was her, her role model. So she used to watch Serena play. That motivated her to put in the practice because she believed it was possible to become Serena, right? So she put in the practice. She got onto courts and she played and she eventually leveled up and this particular win was the major leveling up for her because she had just actually beat her, beat her idol. And her phrase she said is, I think I'm now going to take Serena's poster off my wall and put my poster, put my poster up. Uh -huh. But if you, if you think about this, if you think about in your schools, the question for you is where are there spaces where all of this takes place, right? Probably your gyms, probably your uh, music, your music places, maybe your theaters, but are your classroom spaces where kids can actually watch each other learn? Can a sixth grader look at an eighth and see what an eighth grader is doing to say, hey, I want to I wanna learn how to do that? Can they practice with each other? Are there these natural occurring um, opportunities? And what we found is when you create these spaces, what you see happening over time is that students then put in the work because they have an idea of who they want to become. They can see it. They see an older kid, a better kid doing it. They say, oh, I can do that. And if you did it, I can do it also. So they begin to put in the work. And because they have the audience, their social capital related to doing that work, they begin to um, they develop the skills. And there's three books that talk about this that are really um, relevant for this work. How many people have read, uh, uh, have read Outliers by, um, talks about the 10,000 um, 10, hours. You know, we think of Bill Gates as being, you know, just this brilliant person. But if you read the book, one of the interesting things is part of his brilliance is that he happened to live in a, in a hometown where a friend of his had access to mainframes when he was in high school. So by the time he got to college, he had already spent all this time, you know, working on computers. So when the, when the, when the, when the technological revolution caught up where it was cheap enough to have mainframes and have desktops, he already had learned. He already had put in the work. And so the same to the young people here who are doing the video work. They're already doing this work at this young age. What does that mean when they get older? How many hours would they have put in by the time they get of age if they choose to want to do this work? The talent code, has anyone read the talent code? If you haven't, if you read the outliers, you need to read the talent code. And the talent code to me is an extension of it. And what the talent code does, it, is, it, it looks at places where all of a sudden a group of people start doing something, um, develop a skill set in a cluster that you wouldn't expect them to do such. It was uh, in Brazil, um, um, uh, soccer, uh, looking at some kids in, um, in California surfing. So what is it that all of a sudden allows a group to develop a, a skill set? And the talent code um, breaks it down by talking about is actually being able to see and practice and repeat and fail over and over again but having figured out how you, can, how you can learn from failure in a very quick way that enables um, these groups of uh, talent to emerge. So the Talent Code is a book worth reading. So the context matters. And then the final one is identity. And why this is important is that this book talks, uh, this, one, this book is talking about in particular um, um, minority youth and identities, but I think is relevant for everyone. And what the book talks about is that everyone has an identity that they're trying to take on. And that subconscious identity is the identity that you then put in work towards. So if you live in a, if you come from a family where the identity is you're going to go to college, then subconsciously you're going to do everything you need to do to go down, you know, that path. It's like it, you would have to consciously say, I'm not going to do this in order for you not to go to college. Um, if you decide you want to be a basketball player, 
subconsciously you're going to do all the activities that you need to do in order to get to that point. And so what the book talks about is how do we help kids take on identities, but then how do we make visible to them what are all the steps that you need to do along the way to take on that identity. And so an example of that is I think most kids know what you have to do to become a basketball player, what do you have to do to become a musician, what do you have to do to become a filmmaker. They know that. But if you ask them what do you have to do to become other types of careers, many of them cannot tell you what are the steps along the way. They have no idea of what that is. So if they don't know, and if their only answer is I need to do good in school, then they won't put in the work along the way to do it because they have no idea what to do. So an example of this is we have a young man who's now a sophomore in college, and um, when he was a junior, senior, senior in high school, he asked to come into our media studio because he was trying to work on becoming a better photographer. And I said, it was a Saturday, like, why do you want to do this? I need to practice my angles. I, need to, I saw this shot that I want to try to create, so I need to practice this particular photo, you know, this, the angles, and I need to work with the lighting and stuff like that. Well, I understood that that was math. He needed to understand angles, and there was a way that he could probably get at this as math. So, but he had this whole set of shots that he was going to do, like 20 of them that he was going to practice, see if he could recreate the shot. So then I asked him, well, what do you do? What, if you, what about math? You know, you're about to take the test. What are you doing to get better at math? How do you practice math? And he's like, what are you talking about? How do I get, only way I get better at math is doing problem sets. He had no concept of what to do to get better at math, but because he had an understanding and a set of activities to get better at photography, he was willing to put in his time. And part of that is he had an identity as a photographer, but he had no identity as a, as a mathematician. And when we asked many of our kids, what is there, there is no identity around being a mathematician besides I need to get good in math in order to go to college. And so part of the work is how do we figure out creating identities that they find relevant. So, with that said, what we tried to do in our work that I'm going to turn to and give you some examples of, is we try to create a model, and this is the co components of our model, where we try to enable kids to have access to learning opportunities in, across all the spaces where they spent their time. So that's school, after school, home, and the community. So in school, we know we had to do standards-driven learning. Right, so that's where the school is. The after school, we try to create spaces that allow kids to develop their passion in an area. In home, it was more self-paced, so I want to learn how to do X, so how can we help them do that? In the community, how could we create spaces that allow them to actually see others doing the work in spaces where they can hang out? So we did all of that and we tried to connect it through a, uh, we created a social network that allowed them to access each other and their work across all these different spaces. And at the center of all this were these performance spaces. If you think about it, when we talked about the basketball court, where were the opportunities that students can constantly showcase their work and see the work of others that would motivate them to do more work? The core components to make this happen um, are skilled mentors, which I'll say more about, are artifact-driven curriculum. So what we did is we changed the curriculum that it was very much around creating products, artifacts, so that the student could easily see is this a good product or is it not? It made it easier for teachers to critique the work because it was like, well, this article is quality for publication or is not. It really focused the critique on what the student, on the actual product as opposed to a, a general critique. We linked the in school and out of school um, programming. And again, as I said, we created a social network that made it possible for a kid to access learning anytime and anywhere, wherever they were. And the goal of that was to end up hopefully with a kid saying, I want to be this role, this is, these are roles I want to take on, which means I need to be able to make these types of artifacts. And in order to make these artifacts, I need to learn how to do these skills. And it's learning how to do the skills is where the, you know, that's where the hard work is. So that's equivalent to I need to learn how to shoot a layup, I need to learn how to dribble. It's not that anyone wants to say I really just want to shoot you know, learn to shoot a free throw, but it's because you want to play in the game that you're willing to put in the practice. And so because we were getting kids to take on identities and roles that they wanted, that enabled, that motivated them to put in the time and effort to develop the skill sets that would enable them to be good at the roles that they, and roles that they take on. So we'll see an example of that. And our question for ourselves as we engaged in this work is if, if, for us to determine if we can be uh, successful, is can we create this learning ecology across these spaces 
where we closed the participation gap between students from the south side of Chicago and students in Silicon Valley. So we always had at our goal is our kids, we were always looking to see every year had we closed the gap. So if we look at what our students are doing and we look at the kids, the comparable group of kids from Silicon Valley, do we see that we're closing or do we see that the gap is still existing? If we're closing it, we're on the right track. If we're not, then we need to figure out what it is that we're doing again. And so we did a, a three-year study following a group of kids, um, comparing kids in Chicago to kids in Silicon Valley. And of course, we did some detailed um, case studies. Uh, I don't know if you probably cannot read those words. Uh, so this is about, this is about six, seven, six, seven years ago when we started it. So the tasks that are on here will probably be different now because we are in different places. But there were 16 things we wanted to look at could, could, could kids do. Um, so basic things like can they create a website, can they create an animation, can they make a movie, can they use CAD, you know, like Google SketchUp to create a model, can they build a robot, NXT robot, create a database, make a game using Scratch, create music, can they create a scientific simulation, what about create a digital piece of art, um, do they know how to use social network to participate and start uh, discussion groups? Can they actually write programming code? And of course, can they make uh, multimedia presentations? So we looked at these 16 activities. Uh, could our kids do them? Um, and how could we help them do them and compare them to kids in uh, Silicon Valley? And I'll show you some about that. So this is what our intervention looked like. Um, the, so the intervention, again, is across school, after school, and in the online space. So in school, we created a media arts class. So every kid is like assuming it's the development of the base literacy. So every kid had to take this class. So instead of having traditional art class, um, every sixth grader had music, uh, digital, uh, a record label. So they made a, their own. It's funny, I'm, I'm sure my age, because I say record label, and they were like, what do you mean by record? Um, we called it a record label, uh, a record label class. Uh, the seventh graders had uh, digital storytelling where they had their own, um, they created their own like TV station. And the uh, eighth graders had a production uh, design where they actually got to create um, designs working with uh, real design houses. So every kid had to do that regardless. Those courses provided the base digital literacy that school teachers or regular school teachers can, can uh, assume that kids have. So for instance, in the sixth grade in the record label, all kids learn how to do a podcast. So that meant the science teacher could say, hey, I now need you to do a, 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 a podcast about your science heroes without having to teach the kid how to do it. They knew at the end of first quarter, every sixth grader knew how to do that. So that's the base literacy classes that were the foundation that allowed the rest of the school to pick up on top of the uh, literacies. Example, the seventh grade, all students had digital storytelling. So by the end of the seventh grade, the school, every kid could do a, a 10 minute movie for the history fair. And the social studies teacher didn't have to worry about teaching the iMovie. They could really you know, focus in on the content. So every kid did the school day. In the after school was purely interest-based. So a kid decided if they wanted to participate. And so on any given day, you had programs, spoken word, digital video, robotics, video games, digital music, graphic design, digital queendom, which is a program targeting women, women only, girls only. Uh, only girls can be in the program because like most places, you know, the girls would say, an eighth grade girl would say, yeah, I might want a program, but I'm not going to be in the program with a sixth grade boy. So we had to figure out how to create the same opportunities, but putting it in a space that was more inviting for girls, but was important that we then push them back into the regular programs. So they couldn't stay in the girls only program for all three years. They had to move into the other programs. Um, we had two things that were important. We call them Freedom Fridays, which is where um, kids showcase the best of the work was showcased to the whole school on every Friday. So whatever you designed in the school day and in the after school or what you did at home, the best of the work would make it up onto a stage where you got to showcase your work. And kids would get a lot of social capital, uh, for, in their words, a lot of props for making, having their video, their song, or whatever it is, be showcased in front of the school. And so you ended up with kids actually, and this is on the south side of Chicago in the home of Michael Jordan, some of the boys deciding that they wanted to stay in the after school program versus being on the basketball team because they felt in their school context having the digital literacies had more social value, social capital, than actually playing on the, on the basketball team. We were probably the only school on the south side of Chicago that had kids choosing, choosing that. And then the virtual space was important. Um, 
I'm not gonna actually go through the details of each one of these, but I will say something about the record label class because I think it was, it's probably one of the, the more interesting classes that we did for its purpose. So the record label class is a sixth grade class. It's the first entry into digital media that all students take, and it's a record label. So the kids are gonna create their own, their own CD and they're gonna actually perform it. They have a showcase at the end of the year where, they're, where they're, they write their lyrics, they uh, create the beats, they create the music videos, they create all the press kits. So it's a place where all the media comes together. But before they can create, they have to spend a lot of time actually critiquing the media that they take in, right? So where they first become conscious consumers, because now they're listening, they're having to critique the songs that they hear, and they're like, hmm, okay, maybe I won't write a song like that. Before the class, if you asked them what they would create, it would be something very much like what it is that they were hearing. But as they had to critique the messages that was in the music, it changed. They're actually, they're, I'm not going to, so I'm not saying that when they left school, they would actually go out and say, I'm not listening to that pop music anymore. But they became much more conscious of it. And so the music and the videos and things that they were able to create at the end of the sixth grade, sixth grade actually formed the basis for them to have media literacy that we would see carry out in other areas. So for instance, when a couple of girls started getting online and having you know, conversations with older guys, some of the kids in their class actually shut down on how they got the password, shut down their Facebook sites because they felt that, I mean, shut down the Facebook sites of the girls who were talking to people that they shouldn't because they said, you know, this is not, you know, an activity and behavior. And they handled it within themselves without necessarily having to take it to the whole community. But that's an example of the type of uh, consciousness that was developed in the class. And again, that class formed the basis where all the digital literacy that the kids needed to, um, needed the base literacy needed throughout the whole school was formed. Um, here's a video. Um, I'm not gonna, it's, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, well, I'll play a little bit of it. So this is a song that, um, again, this is six years, six years ago, where um, two sixth grade girls created, and it's a song about respect. So they've heard all the music videos uh, about particularly rap music. And so they created a song about um, how they needed to be respected. So they wrote the lyrics and they actually um, did the video. I'm not gonna play, cause it's, it's gonna be hard for you to see it and hear it. Um, digital storytelling, the same, the same way. Um, so in the school day in the digital storytelling, all videos had to be re related to school academic subject matter, um, history fairs and things like that. In the after school, digital video, they can make videos about whatever they want. So here's one, they did a horror movie about ice cream for ice cream, right? But in the school day, they're gonna do um, a video about um, um, something having, you know, anything related to uh, history. Um, so using the same skills, academically, in the, school, in the after school, more pop, more pop, more pop culture. So the system that supported all this is a social network, is a social network platform that we built called uh, Remix. Um, that was a version of it is still definitely in, in use today. And so Remix has, um, is that, that's not gonna come off. Hmm. Remix has these components. It has an assessment system. It has a virtual currency. So as kids would create artifacts and put up, if they were viewed as quality, they would get some virtual, virtual dollars that they can then trade in for merchandise related to developing their digital skills. So if a kid, for instance, made 10 high quality videos that were viewed as high quality, they could actually earn a flip camera. Or if they made you know, 10 high quality songs, they can earn a set of headphones. So as they produce media, they could actually earn artifacts that help them. Collaborative projects, I know many of you probably have kids doing collaborative projects, and how do you know who did what? So the system would allow you to understand which role each student played in to be able to um, assess the individual role as you assess the whole problem. Citing sources, uh, debates, um, all kinds of different things. So it's a social network where all the work the kids would create in the school day and in the after school would be joined together. In the afternoon workshop, I'll talk more about um, um, the social network and how it's, how it's being used. I will say this, because many of you probably have used um, so think of it as a cross between Facebook and, and um, Facebook and Moodle. So it has your private school spaces, class spaces, but it also has the ability for the sixth grader and the eighth grader to see each other's see each other's work, with the goal of hopefully motivating, um, hopefully motivating the student to uh, continue to move forward. 
Okay. So the context of our work, um, actually, is this, oh. So here's an example of what, what the work looks like. Hopefully this will play. This is for the person who created the trailer. You're going to say how you decided to do your trailer. Then we'll do warm and cool feedback. In this literacy class at Carter G. Woodson Middle School on the south side of Chicago, students are learning to express themselves using new media technologies. I like how you incorporated everything together and made it dramatic. And learning how to be discerning consumers. Because it seemed like the sound effects took over and you really couldn't hear yourself. Carter G. Woodson is one of four schools that make up the Digital Youth Network a 6th through 12th grade program that was created by the University of Chicago's Urban Education Institute in 2003. The Digital Youth Network takes at the challenge preparing kids for the year 2020 and beyond. And we do that in trying to create partnerships between all the spaces where kids spend their time during the school day, in school, after school and after school programming, at home through the use of online tools and social networks, and in the communities so that surround in us. Log into first class on your laptop. So we've tried to allow kids right. to Log sort of in. learn on demand. Here, this is how you do it. Through Digital Youth Network and the presence of DYN classes inside the school day, our students are gaining access to software and skills that really push the envelope on what we think or what teachers think they're capable of doing. What you guys do those pictures? They're all right there. Students can choose from a variety of after-school pods that are taught by mentors and meet once a week for two hours each. They include digital video production. Yeah, make sure you move in your playhead and then play from the beginning. Digital audio production, robotics, graphic design, and game design. I made it based on playing other games, so I tried to make it like some type of fortress. DYN is just like one of the awesomest, sickest programs ever. It's like technically, it's just like all these awesome, sick programs like gaming all the way to poetry. And after that, every Friday we have something called Freedom Friday. And then sometimes we talk about topics that need to be talked about around the world, like global warming. Exactly. We have many perspectives, not just one. And you can add to that perspective. And some issues are so important, they warrant their own after-school pod. All right, ladies, thank you. The Digital Queendom is an uh, initiative to really support gender equity. The girls often thought that they couldn't necessarily do the work to the same level that the boys would. So we brought the Digital Queendom pod in, giving the girls kind of a safe space and then more engaging kind of content that's focused on their own issue. Think about any kind of advertisements you've ever seen before. What is it they try to tell you to get you to, to try to... We discuss and analyze and critically break down images of females in the media, anything that has the female presence in it. We break it down to see what is empowerment, what isn't empowerment, and how they can create media that better reflects themselves. The DYN network is accessible 24-7 through its closed social network site called Remix World. Students post their work, take part in critiques and discussions, and online mentoring expands learning opportunities beyond the school and program day. Did you put sound in Yeah. It's annoying. I don't like it anymore. If you want them to really be a sophisticated game developer or a graphic designer or a videographer, it's hard to do that with once a week. So we use the online space as an extension and an opportunity for the kids really on their own time to really delve a little bit deeper into the work. Explain to each other these topics to me. Yeah. We just talked about the presidential election. Yeah. Once in high school, DYN students begin to focus on an individual medium. And action. Oftentimes, they also serve as mentors to the younger middle school students. Okay. I'm not sure if we really got that shot. Being a mentor, you know, really teaches me, you know, skills about working in a productive environment. You know, it teaches me how to be professional, how to take those skills oh. that I have already and enhance them, how to teach another generation how to use those. And so hopefully there can be kids that I'm teaching who could wind up being bigger and more famous than I hope to be. You know? Right now I'm editing the clip shorter so that it kind of looks more like a movie. Let's stop. Um, 
And so the, it's interesting to see, because this clip is a couple of years old, the young man who's talking is a junior in, in college now, and one of the other young ladies is a, um, she just spent um, a year over in Prague at a film school, and her interest in film started in um, DYN, so she's now just got a, um, a special fellowship to continue her filmmaking work in, in LA, and the young man, young short guy with the dreads who you'll see in a second, He's, a, um, he's going to USC film to do computer, to do animation graphics. Um, and again, for many of them, they talk about it's the opportunities that they experienced as a youth that led them to have the experiences that made it easier for them as they, as they got older. Um, so one question is, this is the young man, the impact of, of uh, what is the impact of the work? And Jalen, I'm gonna use him as an example. Jalen uh, was 12 here, he's now 16. Uh, much deeper voice, taller. Um, so he was a kid who came to the after school program every day. His parents sort of used it as a babysitting service. So he was there to six o'clock every day. And so for him, he had an interest in, in anime. And so everything he did had to relate it to anime characters. So I don't know if you could really see this over here, but so he learned how to make comic books. He learned how to make music, uh, videos. He also created customized designs for Nike shoes. Um, based on anime characters, and even got some of these actually um, created. So he has a series of Nike shoes that are based on anime, anime characters. But he also was in robotics. He learned how to uh, create his own version of Tetris, and he did digital music. So if we think about what a renaissance kid is, his, he developed a set of skills in all these areas that no matter what his interest is, he can figure out how to embed it into, how to take technology and how to embed it in. And he's not, he's not alone. So remember the um, representation I showed you early of the kid Maurice, who had very limited experiences from um, the age of zero to the fifth grade. So if we look at his, if we go from the sixth grade forward, so this is zero to the fifth grade, as he was in our program, you can look at now when we start creating experiences across home, school, and after school, all the different things that he's creating. You don't need to read them, but let me sort of give you an example of what's going. The bottom roll has to do with what he's doing at home. The, that's the, the tan. The, the blue is what's taking place in school day, so requirement. The green is what's taking place in the after school. And then the orange is, is he actually showing it, is he teaching anyone out in the community? And what you see for him is that as he's learning in one space, it's influencing what he does in the other space. So as he learned to create films, he decides to make videos for his father for, uh, for, for, uh, for Father's Day. He learns how to create his own social network so that he ends up doing workshops for teachers and how to use social network. But the more interesting, the, the interesting piece is, is all these names up here. If we go back to this screen, you see very few people here who he's, who he's learning with and he's teaching with. It's his mother, his father, and his science teacher, right? Those are the people who he's involved with technology. If you go to this screen, you see there's tons of people. They're the digital mentors, they're his peers, because he has a social community where learning to do digital media becomes important. And so all these people he's, in, he's involved with and connected with, and that gets to the notion of audience. So his audience is much bigger there. And as an example of what this means as, you play, as it plays out over time, I'm gonna show you an example. Well, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this example. The academic outcomes uh, for doing the work, um, because the first question people have about digital media is, does it actually, does it take away from traditional academic outcomes? So if a kid is spending all the time making movies and songs, what does it mean about their ability to write? But the thing about any digital artifact, it starts as a traditional artifact. To write a movie, you have to write the script. To make a song, you need to write the lyrics. And so what you see is actually by the time you see the video, a script has probably maybe gone to 20 something iterations. And so we actually see improvement in our work in kids' core writing, writing skills because we force them to write. So for us, a kid can't make, get the video camera until they show us the script. You can't get to the recording studio unless we see your lyrics. So because we forced the traditional, we forced representation in the traditional literacies, what we saw is that our students went from 5% going to the most selective schools in the, in the city of Chicago to over 40% going to the most selective schools. The test scores outperformed the state. Um, 
in addition, they had these digital, uh, digital uh, portfolios. Let's see. And to the question we had earlier about whether we actually did, were we able to close the gap between our kids and the kids from Silicon Valley? What we did see is that, of course, our, if we look at these 16 activities, we saw that in the span of the three years, kids started out with only having done four things once. By the time they graduated eighth grade, they had done 11.5 things more than once. If we look at how many things they had done more than once, like in depth, had they done it more, more than um, six times, we see that at the beginning they had done one thing. By the end of eighth grade, they had done four things at least six times. So they had a depth of experience, which means a kid had made you know, four videos, they had done three games, they had done six songs. And so when we compare our kids to the kids in Silicon Valley, which is the comparison group for us, um, at the beginning of the sixth grade, 96% of our kids have fewer digital experiences than the kids in Silicon Valley. So there was a wide participation gap, which we would expect. At the end of the eighth grade, 86% of our kids had more experiences than the kids in Silicon Valley. Um, and and this, is a stud this is a survey that was done by colleagues at Stanford who did the survey across both places. So our kids had, the, had more experiences. And if you ask the kids in, um, um, if you ask the kids well, what led to that development? The kids in Silicon Valley would say, well, they learned how to do everything from their parents, from their fathers, and the kids in Chicago would say they learned how to do it in the after-school context. And this is an important slide that I think is, um, um, is important to talk about, and hopefully you can see it. When we interviewed the kids in Chicago and the kids in Silicon Valley and asked them, well, what roles did the adults play, not just who taught me? Um, there was a big difference between the roles that were played. So there's this concept called learning roles that for anyone to learn, there's these seven roles that they need played. Someone needs to be a teacher, a learning broker, project collaborator, resource provider, a supporter, a learner, or employer. So there's seven roles. And any kid, if you have two parents, there's a possibility of 14 of these roles being played. In Silicon Valley, parents played on average um, seven, um, ten, 10 of these roles. In Chicago, they played on average four, four to five of these roles, um, 10 to 6.5, right? But when we looked at the data, part of this is, in, because you're talking about technology, of course, the parents in Silicon Valley, they're naturally talking to their kid about, hey, don't you want to do this technology project? In Chicago, the parents don't have the, didn't necessarily have the experiences to do this. But what we found is that the after-school program was able to, um, to make up for that. And so when you ask the kids, where do they learn their skill set? The kids in Chicago would say the after school and the, kids in Chicago, and the kids in Silicon Valley would say their fathers or their mothers. But what's important about this is because to the question of can you close achievement gaps, participation gaps, if you can figure out how to provide, create the learning spaces where these roles are played, regardless if they're played by parents, they can be played by peers, older peers, they can be played by um, experts that you bring into the community, you can create an environment such that kids can uh, close and make up, make up the difference. I want to quickly move to, so we did this work in schools, that's great, um, but what happens when the kids leave the high school? So we were challenged to take on um, libraries, and this is an, an, um, an important example to talk about. So in Chicago, I don't know, like in, uh, do kids go to the libraries on their own in your communities? They choose to want to go to the libraries? That's good, okay. In Chicago, no one, kids do not go to the libraries at all. It's just not a place that you, you just don't go. You might go if you have to check out a book, but it's not, I don't mean your school library, but the local, but the local library. So we were challenged to think about how can we transform the, uh, the libraries. And so we knew that technology alone wasn't the solution, so we weren't gonna just replace books with computers. We had to think about how do we redesign the spaces. And so what we created were these concepts called Umedia, which are these digital spaces for kids where they can come in, play video games, they have recording studios, cameras, and all these different things. But what's more important is they have these performance spaces where kids can actually showcase their work to each other. And what, what transpired is that in Chicago, you moved from libraries with having um, 20 kids come into after school to having library spaces with 200, 300 kids will come into these spaces to do work related to books. So as an example, um, 
here's what the library looks like. So you have kids checking out books, but you also have them recording music. You have them working collaboratively together, building games and all these different things. But we created projects where they have to take books that they're reading and they have to figure out how to create digital artifacts around it. And so one of the challenges we had is that we would get kids doing all these digital things in after school in the library, taking a book like A Mercy by Toni Morrison. I don't know if you've ever, Toni Morrison is a hard read. I took a class in Toni Morrison in college. So getting a ninth grader on their own to read Toni Morrison and to create a digital product uh, um, says a lot. But kids on their own would choose to come in and create these artifacts. And here's an, a little video of what it, what it looks like. It was just great to see like, all these students come together across media, uh, work with different mentors, and the work that they've been producing has been amazing. When I was reading the book, I read the line, as I let it read, the slave by choice. And this picture kind of like... One second, just pay attention as you see the kids, the label, the role. These are how they define themselves. So you ask them, she views herself as a spoken word artist. And so it gets to, remember I said earlier that if they have an identity that motivates them to do the work. So you'll see the kids talk about the identities that they've taken on in this work. Actually, it was just a dream kind of to be able to read a book that you wouldn't normally read and then it has so much of an effect on you that you can put your own musical emphasis on it. Salted tears dancing in scrapes sting like ringing slaps. They dance to the rhythm you pound into drums. Skin stretched taut over dismantled jaws and collarbones. We dance to music. He's going to be singing some of the lyrics that I wrote. Light, light, dark day. I wrote a poem um, as if I were the character Florence, and so he's gonna be singing like I. He's gonna be singing sort of like lyrics that I wrote. Um, I wrote the poem, and then afterwards there's like a little song, so he's gonna be singing that as well as um, producing the beat, most likely. Like Master told Mama, it'll hurt at first, but give it time. You will love the thing. My mama named me Florence, so I wouldn't wither under the harshness of a man. There's a strength in my decrepitness, a fragment of your pedigree couldn't muster. It's been cool to see how much can come from one book and how like a vast array of work has come from this one book. Not only are they reading books, but they're you know, making these great projects, uh, these media projects around books. I think it, a special, the special piece for that for me is that it's something that can be replicated in schools, uh, and I hope literacy teachers, you know, take heed and you know open up the doors of what is possible uh, with students learning this media. I'm gonna uh, stop there on that example. So, what you those were kids from ninth to twelfth grade across probably thirty to forty different high schools choosing to come together after school to to create digital work around the book of, um, a book of mercy. They could only get to the creation part if they could defend their interpretation of the book. And so I always like this screen here. It's because you, here's the Book of Mercy and you see all, the, all the, the little notes that this kid has in the book because they understand that to, to create a digital artifact, they have to first say that this is, this is where it comes from in the book. And so I like this example because we had a kid who was here who was also reading Pride and Prejudice in the school day. And the assignment in the school day was to create a big 36 by 36 poster board of all the words you don't know and write out the definitions of them and to bring them to school. Now, the same kid had the role, he was the music kid, he had the identity as a musician, so he's really listening and reading the text to figure out how he can turn that, that interpretation into, into artifact. So I think it's very much possible to take these digital, to take, to use digital media as a, as a vehicle for helping kids explore traditional literacies if we can figure out how to create spaces that cross home, school, and after school places where kids might learn skills in one place, but they can bring those skills to bear in the other place. And they develop these identities that can, that can go along with them. 
And I think I want to um, close by giving you one last example, if I can find it. And what this looks like, again, this, is probably, this, is not, this isn't coming out well. Um, hmm. this, is a, this is a representation of one young woman, um, two, two years of her participation in, yes, yeah, it's not coming, it's, it's gonna be hard to explain to you. But here's a representation of her um, participation in, in U Media for two years. And what we see in this is what, what programs she did in the after school, but all the media that she created and, it's, and how it all comes together. But it's hard, it's, because you can't see it, it's sort of hard. It, it doesn't make sense to describe it uh, that much. So what I hope that I've done is actually give you an example of how you can work across these different spaces, that you can create roles that kids want to take on, help them understand the artifacts that they need to create, and then helpfully help them figure out how to put in the time and energy to develop the skills that are going to be necessary for them to take on those roles, which is something that repeats itself over and over again. Thank you.